I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land, um, specifically the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation, and acknowledge their elders past and present. And also like, acknowledge that as occupiers, we are occupying on occupied land that's been colonized for a really long time, and acknowledge that that's happening. Um, I'll speak. Oh, also, can everyone put their mobile phones on silent if they haven't already done that? Um, yeah. Oh. yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> Everyone's yeah. just like. <laughs> <laughs> see that. I see that. Um, our speakers for this evening are very exciting. Um, first, we've got uh, Jesus Casilla, who is on the Skype. He's an indignados activist from Seville in Spain. Um, he's been involved since May and he's also a union activist. Um, the second speaker tonight, which is a recent addition to the program, is Christian from Chile, who's part of the student convergence movement then, and also part of Occupy Chile. Um, then we've got two Occupy Sydney speakers, uh, Wenny Terezia and Jesse Weinhausen. So without further ado, I'd like to give the back up to Skype, I guess. So, yeah. It's not working. Are you there, Jesus? Yes, yeah, okay. I'm here. It's time to begin. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, first I would like to apologize for my English because it's not very good, but I'm in the at the other side of the planet, so I, I hope you are fine there in, in Australia. I would like to to say that the Indignados movement that started in in the Spanish state in May 15 before the summer change the political situation in the Spanish states totally. Millions of people went out to the, to the streets and occupied the squares all around the, the Spanish state. And people started, many, many people, hundreds, thousands of people started to say that the democracy we are living in is a, is a shit. <laughs> we, were, we were fighting in, in the 70s here against a, a dictatorial regime with Franco. Um, many old people were saying that because they were fighting very hard, we, we had a democracy. But little by little, people started to see that what we had in the, in the 70s, in the transition from the Franco regime to this democracy, it was something that we don't like because the same people who were in the who, who got rich with franco and who had the power with franco still they have the power now in the democracy and now with the crisis people are seeing more clearly that the banks and the big companies are in the government and however the conservative party win the elections of the social de democrats are in the government still are the bankers who are ruling our country mm. so that has been a i think a great ideological um, a step forward for for the movement showing the people that this democracy is not working and that we have to to fight for, for a better democracy but also in the movement in the street um, i'm christian Millian i'm from uh, the university of valparaiso I represent the grassroots uh, student movement from uh, called Student Convergence. And today I'm here um, because of the, I'm the head for different comrades and also from LASNET. Que hizo posible estar acá hoy, hoy día para hacer ciertos foros dentro de Australia y estar presente también acá con and, ustedes. And thank you for letting me speak here today also. Quisiera aclarar primero que todo el asunto de los Cupa dentro de cómo se ha visto políticamente en Chile. En Chile, la situación de los Cupa may be different. I'm going to explain that. Entonces, creo que en Chile el término Cupa o indignado viene arrastrándose desde mucho tiempo solamente que con otros nombres, como trabajadores sindicales. En Chile, en Chile, the Occupy movement of the Indignate movement is coming with another banners like uh, workers without job. O sea, en general, ¿qué quiero decir con esto? Que los indignados hemos sido siempre en Chile, en Latinoamérica en general, siempre han existido indignados. 
in Latin America, all this has been existing like people and people who are organized mm -hmm. in this way. Mm -hmm. Ahora lo que quiere decir claro, dejar claro que un movimiento no puede quedarse solamente en eso y tiene que generar una propuesta de proyecto político. And uh, as as uh, we like to also say that if a movement can also have to be clear uh, and, and incorporate a political proposal or a political project inside the movement. De que el, la forma la, de ocupar un territorio es solamente una forma de protesta. Because the Occupy is just a way of protest. Y, y lo que nosotros estamos lo que se está mostrando con toda esta revuelta mundial de Ocupa mm -hmm. es que el sistema capitalista está fallando. And what is being shown around the world with this mobilization of the indignation of the Occupy is that uh, the capitalist system is, is failing. Porque el hecho que los bancos, los estados, la iglesia the church, the, the, the state, the banks. Están tomando el poder y están haciendo lo que quieran con la gente. They are doing whatever they want with the people. Tiene directamente relación con la con el, la propiedad privada de los medios de producción. They have relation with the uh, 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 private uh, ownership of the means of production. Entonces lo que nosotros tenemos que lograr en general como movimiento político social no es solamente derrocar un sistema político. So what we have to achieve as a social movement is not only uh, to defeat a political system. Tampoco un sistema económico. No also a economic system. Sino que un sistema general y una forma nueva de cultura y de vida como persona. So we need to try to able to create and build a new way of political and a, a new way of building uh, a new society. Y eliminar toda forma eh, a tiempo ideológico de liberalismo que ataca a nuestros a nuestros pobladores, a nuestros trabajadores. Any kind of liberalism that affects our peoples. Y generar una sociedad mucho más solidaria. We need to generate a, a solidarity society. Recién acá el compañero hablaba del asunto de que todavía en España había gente que ligada a Franco en el poder. A comrade just from Spain saying that there's still people who are uh, close to Franco in the power. Bueno, en todos los países sucede lo mismo. La dictadura y la clase política se repiten constantemente en la historia. In all the countries the same thing happened. All the political class and the dominant class is still in power and repeat themselves through the history. Y nosotros lo que tenemos que hacer es rendir homenaje a aquellos que históricamente han aportado a la lucha contra estos personajes. That's why we need to pay tribute to all those people who are fighting against capital system. En, en, en Latinoamérica tenemos a Che Guevara. En Latinoamérica tenemos a Che Guevara. Y en España tuvimos a, a Buenaventura Durruti. And in Spain we have uh, Durruti. Quien siempre nos decía. Who always said. Llevamos un mundo nuevo en los corazones. We have a new world in our hearts. Y ese mundo nuevo tenemos que construirlo día a día, and, no solamente en una manifestación. And, and that new world we have to build it every day, not only in a, in a demonstration. Porque solo de esa forma vamos a lograr, a través de la organización y la lucha, because only through struggle, through organization, lograremos tener una vida digna para nosotros como personas de este mundo. We can achieve a, digni a dignified life for everybody. Así que el llamado hoy en día es solidarizar con toda forma de movilización y toda lucha social en el mundo entero. So today we call it to solidarize and support all kinds of struggle around the world. Porque solo a través de la unión vamos a lograr derrotar este sistema capitalista because que genera todas estas fallas. Only through unity we are able to defeat the capitalist system which, which create this situation. Gracias por la oportunidad de hablar hoy en día acá. Thank you for letting talk today. Y decir que sigamos luchando y organizándonos. And to, and to say that we have to continue the struggle and, and, and fighting. No para, no para ser liberados como españoles, no para ser liberados como chilenos, no, no para ser liberados como australianos. No only to be liberated as Chileans, as Spanish or as Australian. Sino para ser liberados como ciudadanos del mundo, como as, personas, como personas dignas de estar presentes so, hoy en día y respirar de manera completa. To be so we have to be liberated as people, as people who are, uh, who are trying to organize different and also to save our planet, you know, our people. Thank you and continue with your travel. que mañana vamos a estar hablando del conflicto estudiantil acá mismo a las 7 de la tarde. Tomorrow we're going to have a meeting here in the same same room. At 7 o'clock we're going to talk about more specifically about the, the student movement. Para mostrar la opinión de nosotros como estudiantes de base. And also to say, uh, to show the, the opinion of the grassroots student movement in relation to the struggle, the actual struggle in Chile. And, and we're going to have more information tomorrow. Yeah. 7 o'clock. Yeah. Back in
in touch with Spain. <laughs> Yay! Yay! Yeah, yeah, so Thank yeah, you, Spain. Yeah, Real Madrid better than Barcelona. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank So I'll put you I'll put you back on now, okay? Mucho gusto. Okay, it's gonna start now. <laughs> so I was saying that it was a, a, an important step forward. So um, started to, to say that the democracy we are living in is not working and that we have to to build a, a different kind of democracy. Um the movement started with demonstrations, and every every month the demonstrations were being bigger, and still as after the summer were bigger, and millions of people went out to the streets, and the movement has the support of 80% of the population who thought that um, the, to change the, the situation. So everybody was happy. We many people were waiting for this something like this from since many years before. But what we what, and we were able to, to stop evictions of people when the banks put them out of their own houses because they cannot pay the, the loan. Mm. So that was something also very very important because we were showing that we were able to do things. Mm, more than go out to the streets in, in big demonstrations. So when we started to, to stop <coughs> evictions, the, the state sent more police and the repression level mm, was higher and then they, they were able to put the people out of their places. And also we were able to stop immigrant detection in, in some neighborhoods we have a very racist police here, and they they stop you in the streets if you look like you are not from here. So people in the neighborhood they started to to organize themselves to stop these kind of racist detentions, and we we were successful in in Madrid, for example, to do this. Um, the movement started in. in with big demonstrations and occupying the, the squares of the cities. And from there, we moved to, to, to the neighborhoods. So now the, the movement <coughs> is organized in the, in the neighborhoods. We thought that doing this, we will be able to involve more people in the movement, so that the regular people, normal people from the neighborhoods, working class neighborhoods, they could, they will join the movement, but this mm, has not been like we thought. People mm, are willing to fight, and people are they want to go out to the street to the demonstrations. So the demonstration is still are very very big, the biggest demonstration we have had since the anti-war movement in 2003. But people don't go to the assemblies in the neighborhood. So the assemblies now, the movement in the neighborhoods are pretty small. And we have now mm, problems in the movement. We are seeing that the, the state, the Spanish state, is worried about big demonstrations and about the occupation of the square, but they, they don't they don't do anything, they don't change the politics because we go out in big demonstrations. <coughs> mm, and they don't change the policy because we occupy the, the squares. So we think now that we need uh, to build a connection between this movement and the working class. Because in the, in the movement there are many workers but they are not uh, acting from their working places. They are acting as citizens in the streets, marching or occupying the squares. But we, we are seeing that mm, this is not enough. We have seen, we look always out of our borders and we look to 
Greece or to Egypt, for example, and we see and we speak with the with the people in in Greece, and we they they have had more than 15 general strikes, and still the government is doing social cuts. So here in the Spanish state, we we think that the movement if the movement doesn't connect with the with the working places, the movement is going to <coughs> die off. So now we are we are trying to build these bridges between the movement and the and the unions, but it's not uh, an easy thing to do because our unions, as the big unions, not the alternative the small unions, but the big unions, are very bureaucratized. So um, the bureaucrats of the unions don't want to fight and we go, have to go to the rank and file of the of the companies for example in the neighborhood if we are working in an assembly we go to the and there is a factory in the neighborhood we go to the factory and we speak to the rank and file <coughs> of the of the unions there to say that we want a general strike and for them to to press to the bureaucracy of the union to call for a general strike. We had mm, general elections two weeks ago, and the Conservative Party won the, the elections. We had the Social Democrats in the, in the government before the elections, and they were doing a policy against their own social basis, against the working class people who vote for the Social Democrats. So the movement, mm, one thing that I think the movement did is that people saw that there are other alternatives than the Social Democrat Party. So they didn't vote for the Social Democrats. And only two of ten vote for the Social Democrats. So the Conservative Party with three of ten voters won the elections. And now we have an even worse government than before. Mm. So this is something that the movement did, and I think it's positive in the way that the social democracy now in the Spanish state is in a total crisis, and we don't know if they will be will be able to recover, probably they will because they have a lot of power in the in the media and they have a lot of money, but they still they are going now through a very difficult situation. But the, we have a, now a government, a conservative government who is mm, under the pressure of the European Union, under the pressure of the International Monetary Fund and this government is going to do in in one week. They are starting to do very important social cuts, privatization of our social security, of our education services. They are cutting environmental environmental money for environmental protection. They are cutting everything. So. We hope that in this situation, the big unions will call for a general strike, and in this strike, we, the movement have to be together with the workers and with the unions uh, to, to push the general strike to, the, to their success and to get into a dynamic similar to the dynamic they are in Greece. We think that this is the way to to do to, for the movement to go forward because we have seen very very big social movements here for example against the war in iraq and in the same way that the movement was going up then it was going down very fast so mm, i don't know i think that this is the general picture of what we have here we have very big demonstrations, but the people don't go to the assemblies in the neighborhoods because they don't have mm, a very high political mm, 
I don't know how to say in English, but um, mm. they they don't feel like waking up at 11 o'clock in the morning on Saturday to go to an assembly, but they they go to big demonstrations. And if 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 there is a general strike, they will they will join it. Oh. See, for us to 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 do what we want to do because we need to act from the working places, but still. We don't have enough power in the unions to to do this for ourselves. This is all. <laughs> I'm just going to ask you if he has time for a couple of questions, if people are interested in that. I'm going to take that as a yes. <laughs> Hi. Um, do you have time to answer a couple of questions? Yes. Okay. Um, I will have to say the questions. So we're just going to ask the questions, and I'll relay them into the phone. Tim. Um, is there an ongoing occupation or occupations in Spain? And if so, because we heard a lot about free university, um, free sort of the kitchens. How are those occupations going in terms of providing people with services the government is cutting? Okay. Um, we've heard a lot about the occupations in Spain and we're wondering how they're still going. And specifically, we heard a lot about services such as food or free education that we provide to people by the occupation. And we're wondering how they're going, especially in the context of cuts being made by the government. I'll just put you back on the screen. Question of what? <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. Um, the question is about during the occupation, we heard a lot about uh, free education or food being provided to people. Uh, we're wondering how that's going at the moment and if it's still happening. I'll just put you back on. When the when the movement started and um, people. The, the squares. It was amazing because um, we were realizing how we could build the society by ourselves without needing the companies or without needing yeah the all the the state. No? It was in a very small scale, but in the squares, people were organizing by themselves everything. So they were organizing the food. They were even. I don't know, planting tomatoes in the middle of the square. They were mm, connecting with mm, agriculture in, mm, close to the city so they could get the food directly from the producers. And they will, we were all doing libraries, we were doing like, mm, like mm, le school lessons in the streets and everything. We were building like a small city in the squares and all, everything was done in a very democratic way from the from below. But that mm, disappeared when the when the occupation of the of the squares finished. And now there are social mm, smaller social movements who are doing who are trying to do these things in the neighborhood. Mm, it's not in the same way that when we were occupying the, uh, the squares. Hi, I might ask for one more question. Three more. Three more? No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mark, can you keep it really simple for me to relate? Um, just about the future. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> oh. Why not give him the phone and let him speak okay, it direct? Yeah. Good thinking. Uh, yeah. yes. um, Obviously, so what the time of the program is. Obviously, this is a very good thing. I Charla sobre derechos humanos y el 18 una manifestación para apoyar los derechos de los inmigrantes. 
Y también he leído que tenéis un, una cosa muy grande. Estáis preparando ya para el 15 de mayo. El 15 de mayo en I'll say it in English now. It just saves time. You could call me a wank if you like. Um, um, 10th of... I'll just... I asked about 10th of December, the Global Day of Action, uh, what they're planning across the country, because I'd seen that in, um, in Madrid, they're planning like a mass sort of conference about human rights in, in Seoul. I think he might explain what's going on, and okay, I'm sure. he has to go <laughs> somewhere. Right. So I'll just put you back into the speaker. Good point, man. Okay. Uh, we are we are uh, organizing uh, another day of big demonstrations for March, 15 March, and for May also. And between the big demonstrations, that is amazing how how big we are surprised every 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 day. We we call for a big demonstration for the movement. We are surprised because. Every day, more people go out to the streets. No, no a political party, no a big union, nobody now can call for bigger demonstrations than the Indignados movement can. And we are keeping to we are keeping with these demonstrations, but it's not enough, as I said before. And between these big demonstrations. The, mm, some people inside the movement are calling for actions, for example, for supporting immigrants or other kind of actions. And for example, for the, our right to have a, have a huge problem here that people cannot have. And at the same time, the bankers are putting the people out of their houses when they cannot pay. So it's clear that the this system cannot give us what or seek needs. Be these sectorial calls between the big demonstrations are usually smaller. But yes, we are we are doing different things inside the movement because people are more worried about um, immigrants or other people are more worried about um, the home things or, or this kind of of things. But the, the good thing of the movement also is that it's a good place to coordinate all. And so now, before the movement, everybody was doing things in, in, in a separate way, and now we share information and we are aware about what other um, people are doing. Thank you. Uh, do you have time for one more question? Um, could you tell us a little bit about how the neighborhood occupations went before they sort of fell away or became small? Okay. Oh. Okay, I'm just going to put you back on. Okay. <laughs> so everyone gets to you. Okay, the, the occupations after the big demonstration, some people camp in Madrid, in Puerta del Sol, and the police, were police, that is very clever, they put them out in the middle of the, of the night. So a solidarity movement started in every city. Um, we occupy hundreds of squares all around the Spanish state. From there, um, we decide we wanted to go to the neighborhoods. At the beginning, in the neighborhood, we had big assemblies. For example, in my neighborhood, we have like 200 people. And that was very, that, that we thought it could go even bigger. But with, with the time, the assemblies in the, in the neighborhoods started to be smaller. And now, for example, in my neighborhood, we are like 30 people. But, Still, the people want to fight, but they don't see the need to go to an assembly on a Saturday morning, for example, or Monday or 
whatever. They don't see the need to go to an assembly. They want action. So the the movement in the in the neighborhood, it's good for to keep the movement alive and to keep a group of people who is thinking what to do. But it's not good to to fight and action. Thank you so much. I'm going to put you back onto Amy to take away. Um, now we're going to have Wendy for a speak, and then Jesse, and then we're going to have some discussion. So, Jesse, please make ready. I'm going to stand so I'm a little bit less short. Um, and if you can't hear me, um, just do this so I can speak louder. just want to begin by acknowledging that we are meeting on European occupied land and to pay my respects to traditional owners past and present. I um, really want to thank the people that organised this space. I really am looking forward to um, what I hope and imagine will be a really um, fruitful discussion for Occupy going forward. Um, it's really amazing to be part of you know, I guess to have a reminder in this room about the global, <laughs> exactly, the global context of Occupy, um, which I think is quite astounding. And I guess I'm really interested in, in definitely exploring, um, you know, what that means for here in Australia and what's going on here. And suddenly there are lots of people in this room who, um, you know, have your own experiences of Occupy and your perspectives, and I'm really looking forward to hearing them. Um, so I just thank the General Assembly that I guess asked me to come forward and um, share my ideas. Um, and what I just wanted to do is just, rep like, I feel like it's really important to, before we're talking about, yeah, moving, like, I guess, ideas going forward, just to take a bit of time to take stock of um, what we've done and where, and where we're at, and to acknowledge that it's been 46 days since Occupy started. <laughs> Collectively, it's certainly been no small feat um, to stay there the week that we did at Martin Place to experience the dawn raid eviction that we did with, you know, 100 white police um, basically, you know, brutalising um, us and our camp. Um, you know, the really quite intense policing, obviously, that we have experienced the intimidation and prov provocation tactics, particularly during the 5th of November when we're attempting a reoccupation at Hyde Park, I think would be a really clear example of the type of policing that we have been experiencing here. Um, and since the 7th of November, there have been, if people don't know, um, small groups of people staying at Martin Place, experiencing various types of police tactics every single night. And it's a real, I think, just, it's no small feat to still be here and still be talking. Um, it hasn't been perfect at all, easy, I'm sure everyone understands that and I just think it's really great that we can, you know, look forward to, to, to what's next. Um, as a bit of a tally, if people don't know, I've been mainly doing um, some of the legal support stuff around Occupy. The current tally of arrests is 59 arrests, um, 29 people have charges out of their arrests. Is this in Sydney or across Australia? This is in Sydney. Yes. Um, 29 people have <laughs> charges, 16 people have received fines and a further 12 fines have been um, given out. So that's, you know, it's not a small number of, of court and fines and arrests that we've been experiencing. And I just wanted to acknowledge some of the things that we have done from the various rallies that we've done to various creative actions that people have done. You know, yoga as a, as a public <coughs> protest. I just think that's, that's amazing. I was um, in yoga. Yeah, right? Um, you know, yoga as a, it's, yeah. Um, the, the outreach, things that people have done out in the suburbs, Occupy the Love. Um, also things like supporting Qantas workers in the industrial dispute going on, the free schools that have started to happen. And, you know, nightly and then now three times a week, the General Assemblies where we do try to make decisions as a movement. You know, it's not easy by any means, but just to acknowledge what we've done. Um, so in terms of going forward, I just thought what might be useful is um, really quickly, hopefully, not. Yeah, just to kind of generate some ideas. Um, I just wanted to identify some of the key um, features that I, I feel are, um, make up Occupy Sydney and to, to reflect a bit on that and to just raise some ideas for further discussion. So three main things. The first 
thing I think that is a really cool part of what Occupy is about is suddenly the aspect of reclaiming a public space. And I think that what that means, why that is important is um, that act in a privatised world which is a real, like a, a visible opposition um, that reflects why we're here, that reflects our concerns about economic injustice as perpetuated by these ideologies of neoliberalism, privatisation, corporatisation um, in, our, in our lives. Um, it has suddenly acted as an ongoing base where people can come and find out about Occupy, they can come, meet, talk, build connections, build trust, build relationships and um, organise together. And that again, I, don't, you know, I think is a core part of what Occupy is, is about. And what I've experienced um, in terms of being there is, is, I guess, even just, I think it is an empowering form of direct action to be there the way we are. Um, and it's given, uh, you know, the feedback that I feel like I experience from the public is that we are, we give people hope. <coughs> Um, and that's, again, that's not um, a small thing in, in our world um, with everything that's going on and, you know, all the things that we try to do to, to address that. Um, suddenly there are obviously challenges about staying there and in Occupy tensions about, um, I guess, the, the importance of that physical base for Occupy. Um, so I just wanted to recognise that you know, suddenly some people feel like a core part of Occupy is having a physical, ongoing, visible space. Um, and there are other, there are other, I guess, people that have expressed that the, the key question is how to build Occupy outside of that base. Um, what I wanted to offer is I really think that we're talking at cross purpose a little bit and obviously we're both, like both those camps, I guess, are talking about how to build Occupy. Um, the question is about how, you know, and Certainly a physical base could be part of that. And certainly people want to be talking about how to build participation and build, you know, within Occupy to build the diversity of that movement. So, you know, I guess some of the ideas that I've heard ex expressed to, to move forward are things like lots of different types of occupiers in, in various suburbs. Um, getting many more um, groups involved within Occupy in various ways. Um, this, you know, it's just something that I really would like to talk about. But I just wanted to move okay, to, I guess, these two other features that of Occupy that I feel like um, are important to talk about. The second element would be um, our attempts at doing consensus. Um, it's certainly challenging and a learning process. I'm sure everyone that has experienced a general assembly at, at Mata Place would annoy. Um, I, <laughs> I do think it is important because I feel like that process is a way that, you know, people have identified globally um, as a way of building real democracy in a way that addresses the political alienation that is also why we're there. Um, I, I think they are based on the various principles that reflect values that have been identified within Occupy Sydney, like equality, um, mutual respect, diversity, inclusivity. I think it is about building leadership from the bottom up, um, where everyone's a leader, no one's a leader. Um, but it's certainly not without its challenges. And, you know, I think that, I, I feel like in order to build genuine and powerful collective action, we, we need to do it better. We need to figure out how to make it work. Um, and I guess another like development that I feel like I've experienced within Occupy that I just wanted to raise questions about um, is this idea that you know there there are things that people go to to the General Assembly to um, pass by consensus, and if and when that doesn't happen, now I feel like they've started to happen as autonomous actions. Um, and I just you know wanted to I guess say that I I think this is. A, bit of a curious and, and worrying development in my mind where I think it really misunderstands what autonomous actions are um, which suddenly can be endorsed after the fact I guess of, of them happening. Um, are they autonomous I, with the sort of identity of Occupy? They're autonomous in terms of they're not they haven't reached the consensus of the General Assembly and so they just happen anyway. Do they happen under the name of Occupy? Of, of Occupy, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and I, I see that as, as happening right now as a way to sidestep the General Assembly and I know that those processes aren't perfect, but I still think that it is important to try and, you know, acknowledge again why we've been trying to have those General Assemblies 
as an open participatory consensus based forum where we can make decisions together that take Occupy forward and suddenly if they're, you know, we're making decisions that affect everyone then I think that that's still something to, to think about how to do better instead of, I guess, giving up. Um, so I just wanted to, to raise that again. Um, and yeah, and, and the need, I guess, essentially in my mind to keep developing these processes that can involve and facilitate more people being involved in Occupy. And it is, I think, going to be a really slow process. I think that in our hierarchical societies, we don't have experiences of decentralised decision making, consensus based decision making. It might take a long time. I just hope that we don't give up because it's too hard. Um, that's all. The last thing is, um, and this is, I think, that the, the thing that I'm, I think is really exciting about Occupy in many ways is Occupy as a political space for, um, ex for exchange and for um, building solidarity. Um, you know, we're, we're here at Occupy because we want to see things changing. Um, and I think that I, you know, one of the main criticisms that I feel has been leveled towards Occupy is that we don't know what we want. And our response suddenly is, look, you know, we're still meeting, we're still trying to figure that out. Um, instead of doing that most of the time, obviously we're dealing with, you know, the state apparatus in terms of the policing that we're experiencing. Obviously that's going to make things hard. But I agree that I think it is important to be clear <coughs> about why we're there and what we want. And I kind of wanted to talk about this 1%, 99% thing a bit, because um, I think there's suddenly a sense that Occupy is a broadly, you know, progressive populist movement um, for the majority. Um, for me, um, to create change, it is, for me, it is not about taming the system of capitalism in some way to make it better for the majority. I think that in order for that to happen, the system needs to change. And I think we need to be bolder about talking about that in my mind and clearer about how to go about doing that. Um, yeah, I guess certainly, uh, you know, and I don't think this is <coughs> revelatory. I think we agree that, uh, we agree with that, but I think that we need to talk about that more and, and figure out um, how to work together to build that change that we want based on um, principles of justice from the ground up. Um, so for me, I think for Occupy to grow, it's not about trying to become more of a mainstream movement, but to try and connect with the majority and to show them why and how we can work together for change, to change the system, why this moment in history is important, you know, why, um, yeah, I guess, why we're still together, even though, for me, Occupy breaks all the rules, all the rules of <laughs> activism and all the rules of life, like sleeping. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we're still here because I think we feel like there's something, there's something happening and there's, and there's a way that Occupy can support <coughs> concrete changes happening in our lives. And part of that for me is, like, the developments towards supporting local struggles around Qantas workers, teacher strikes, um, there's an action tomorrow to support cleaners that have been running a really strong campaign, Clean Start. You know, I think Occupy is a hub for that exchange to build solidarity, I think. Locally and globally is really powerful. Um, and, yeah, I guess, you know, that's that's the main thing that I want to, uh, those are the main things, I guess, that I want to talk about. I think, certainly, it's such a learning experience um, and really about living together, about organising together, about t trying to figure out these alternatives to, to these injustices that we see. Um, but yeah, I guess I just, I'm curious to talk certainly more about Occupy as a physical base and, and how to defend and build that and how to build further participation. I like to talk about our processes to build democracy and to make decisions and how to make those better. Um, and then finally, how we, how we organize together, how we demonstrate solidarity. Um, that's about it, except to mention that um, in terms of the legal stuff, um, we've got quite a big, quite an important court date coming up on Monday, the 5th of December at the Downing Centre. People are free to come down from 9am. Um, what's happening with the legal stuff is we've got, you know, a bit of a, a legal um, team headed up by Stuart Littlemore, Queen's Council, instructed by Marsdens to do a constitutional challenge in the High Court um, based on what we have experienced as abuses of police powers um, to
to override our right to protest and, and communicate politically. So if people are free, come down, come in camping gear. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'd also like to acknowledge that um, we are following this um, Aboriginal land, land that was never ceded, and pay um, my respects to um, this um, so yeah, thank you to um, the outreach team and the General Assembly for giving me this opportunity to um, share a few ideas I've got about where to go from here. Um, I also wanted to talk a bit about our successes, um, because despite our small population... Um, Excuse me. <laughs> uh, yeah, despite our small population and the fact that we are not hurting any, anything like the Americans are hurting right now economically, uh, we have represented, I really think we have. Um, when he talked about uh, our occupations and the ongoing occupation that, that is happening at Martin Place right now, uh, and that's just incredible that, that we've been keeping it up. Uh, we've had three great rallies uh, that have brought thousands of people down to see what we do and I think, importantly, how we do it. Um, and despite, you know, violent crackdowns by police and predictable attacks by the corporate media, I think we've done a really good job of keeping the broader community on side. Um, and just there's just continually an amazing amount of organising, meeting, discussion going on all the time. If you look at the calendar, you just see there's just so much happening, which is just fantastic and really inspiring. Um, so, yeah, I think we have represented and we have brought the most exciting social movement in a generation to Sydney, which I think is great. Um, so I think, look, now that the initial phase of, you know, the excitement and exhilaration and constantly reacting to the next thing and, like, doing more than is possible and then doing more, I think now that that's kind of over for most of us, um, I think it's time, I think it's really time to sort of clean house and really sort a few things out um, because we want to invite people over, and when you invite people over, you clean house. Um, but yeah, come, come through, clean line. <laughs> um, but what I generally do, we can't just stuff things in cupboards and sweep things under the carpet. Um, yeah, I think yeah, we need to bring out the hard stuff, and we need to deal with it. Um, so not only does it look good on the surface, but that it actually feels good to us, uh, and it's something that we are proud of when we it. Uh, and I think then we will be much happier and more <coughs> able and just will be much better at inviting people to share because we will be much happier about what we've created. Um, so I think if we do this, and, and this seems to be a period where we are doing it, um, it's an especially vulnerable period for us. Um, and so I think it's a period where we really have to treat each other um, with real sensitivity. Um, so if we're going to get serious about facing these issues, and these are issues that have the potential to bring down social movements. I don't think we should get ourselves. Um, the only way we can do that is by really listening to each other and questioning our own assumptions and beliefs and being willing to compromise. Um, like, the point isn't to win arguments. The point is to build the solid foundations of a long-term, sustainable, inclusive movement. Um, and if that means you have to stand aside or give in to something in the short term, uh, then good on you for being flexible uh, and compromising and showing other people how to do it. Um, and I think this goes especially for the more experienced people, um, the people who have been here before, seen these things play out before. Um, I think we have an even greater responsibility to be open to change and to listen uh, and compromise. Uh, so yeah, and look, I, and what we're doing at the moment is fantastic. We're looking, we're, we're looking at the values. We've been having discussions about the values that underlie the movement. Uh, and I think that's great, but I think it's just as important that we work out exactly how those values translate into our behaviour. Um, because on the day-to-day -day level, you know, that's what really counts, is how our behaviour and how we treat each other. Um, we really have to walk the walk. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think we need to clean house, and we need to like, continue to collect and build on the ideas that, that we've been doing, um, so that we can really start articulating our ideas more clearly. I think it's time that we need to start doing that. And, um, and it's not like about being on message. I think it's about us feeling and becoming more united and feeling empowered to communicate what unites us. Um, and I don't think this is, should be hard because the ideas are profound, but they're also really simple. Like uh, I was having dinner with my mum and she's like, uh, she's trying to get her head around Occupy 
And she's like, but what's it all about, you know, apart from the obvious? And I was like, that's it. It's about the obvious, you know. It's, it's, it's the elephant in the room, you know. It's, uh, we're in the middle of a global financial crisis. We are in the middle of a global ecological crisis. Uh, and then there's the disgraceful, murderous global inequality that sees 21,000 children under five die every day from preventable causes. That's seven and a half million a year, just by the way. Um, so if the problems are obvious, um, we should be asking ourselves what's stopping people from acting. And for a long time I thought it was apathy, and now I don't think it's apathy. Um, I think it's people have been feeling powerless and pessimistic. And I think that's what's really special about Occupy, is that it's given us a sense of power and optimism. Um, and I think it's fundamentally an optimistic movement, um, because just by being here, we're not only saying that another world is possible, but that we are going to make it happen, like, now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so to invite people to join us, yeah, we need to be able to say who we are and um, what we stand for. Um, and I think we've gone a long way so far, largely on the vibe. It's like, it's the banks and the politicians and the corporations and, you know, I know, look, some people are articulating things well, but I think generally we, there is that vibe and it has worked, you know, people do get the vibe. Um, but now I think, you know, we, we have to move on from that and really start clearly articulating um, what it is so that other people can can look and actually make an informed decision about do I really identify with these people? Am I an occupier? Um, and so I think in terms of who we approach, you know, social movements work kind of in concentric circles. So at the moment we've got like a core committed group of occupiers. And so now we need to look at like the next layer. And I think there are sort of two, two sort of next layers. And the first one is friends and family um, because, you know, if we can't convince our friends and family, and not all of them, of course, but some of them, you know, I just, you know, how are we supposed to convince people that we don't even know? So I think it's really important that we test our ideas and our arguments on our friends and family and listen to the feedback, especially the negative feedback, because um, we want to know what, you know, what is keeping people away and what is it that people don't get. Um, so the second layer of people that we need to approach are, uh, our natural allies who are already involved in progressive politics. So these are the long-time activists, the environmentalists, the human rights activists, trade unionists, indigenous rights activists, refugee rights activists, members of all sorts of community organisations, and even members of political parties. Um, because I think deep down, many of them are involved in the organisations they're involved in because of a vibe. And we might be surprised to find out that their vibe is actually very similar to ours. Um, and they might find that the Occupy movement is expressing that vibe and living it in a way that they've never seen before. Um, so, I'm gonna finish up. I'm, I just wanted to um, share a few words from Naomi Klein. She um, addressed Occupy Wall Street with a human mic, and um, this is what she said. She said, um, we picked a fight with the most powerful economic and political forces on the planet. That's frightening. And as this movement grows from strength to strength, it will get more frightening. Always be aware that there will be a temptation to shift to smaller targets, like, say, the person sitting next to you at this meeting. Mm -hmm. After all, that is a battle that's easier to win. And she went on to say, don't give in to temptation. I'm not saying don't call each other on shit. But this time, let's treat each other as if we plan to work side by side in struggle for many, many years to come, because the task before us will demand nothing less. So I'll just finish up by saying that I actually really have faith in us that we're up to this task, because I've seen how we can pull together and make amazing things happen and trust each other and support each other. And if we can keep doing that, I, we won't even need to worry about building, because people will naturally want to come and be a part of what we're doing. Uh, because people, you know, people do want to do something, they just don't know how. And we have to show it, and we have to share with them the sense of power and optimism that this movement <coughs> has given us. We have to share it with them. <coughs>
something that I, I think has been fundamentally needed for a long time um, to bring people together. The biggest thing um, that I have seen is that there will be people that have been fighting to be part of political movements for a very long time, have been fighting to unite with people, have been fighting to be given a go to change the world, have been fighting to, to like, no matter what is thrown up against them, no matter what, you know, like, what argument, whatever, I think, like, it is very, very much, you've got to give people, like, a go, like, not only in organising, not only in talking politics, not only, um, um, in, in guidance and understanding and so like I, I think like it's important like and so like when people ask you for help they're not doing it like to make themselves look good they're not doing it because um, they're trying to make themselves look better they're doing it because they trust your, your intuition they trust your judgment um, if, if you know if people come <coughs> along um, and say, you know, I want to help, I want to get involved, um, you know, I, I want to, you know, reach out to this group or reach out to that group, or they bring along an idea, then that should be encouraged. Like, not only that should that be encouraged, but more importantly, they should be allowed, like, as a collective. Um, we should, like, each be able to share the labour um, between ourselves. Um, I know... Um, we're reaching out to occupy the suburbs, for example, um, and we see like a real like out in Western Sydney, and we're holding out a forum on the 17th, and we see real potential there because um like it's very much like people in Western Sydney they want to know about Occupy. Um, at the same time, um, there are those who want to get involved, um, etc., but can't necessarily travel to the city. So like I think that this movement. Like, you know, let's forget, like, attacking each other. Let's forget um, about, like, who's right or wrong. Who did this wrong? Who did that wrong? Who's a bad person? Who's not? Let's come together as a movement um, to change the world. Like, we are the 99%. You may not like, personally like somebody. You may have been fed a lot of bullshit about them. But give them a go, and I guarantee you might actually be surprised at how much that they will be able to do for this movement. Okay, I think Susan next. Did you go yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, look, I wanted to thank the speakers because I, I think this is, yeah, this is a really great forum actually, very timely um, for us to have this discussion at this time of the year as well, I think, um, and looking forward to next year and um, what we want to do to kind of relaunch and, you know, build on the work that we've done over these 46 days. Um, and... Uh, I, I think no, there was nothing that Wendy or Jesse said that I would have any disagreement with. I, I think absolutely, um, you know, I'd hope that all of us here um, would agree that, you know, there, there are some challenges that we face in terms of how we make decisions and um, making sure this movement is inclusive and can build itself, um, but also that uh, there's a lot of, there's certainly a lot of space, a lot of hope for us to build, to build this movement on. Um, one of the things that um, that occurred to me, like just doing some uh, re reading around the impact of Occupy Wall Street in the United States occupations on the labour movement, was um, a number of labour leaders in the US saying that the tactics and the approach of Occupy Wall Street and a lot of the local Occupy movements around the various states have had a real impact on US labour, um, teaching them tactics that they hadn't used um, ever. Um, and I think, in a way, starting to break through some of that, you know, rather stodgy, um, <laughs> you know, yes. rusted on kind of um, bureaucracy um, that exists in the labour movement and has its reflection in Australia too. So I, re I really do agree that I think that, that making that link with, the, with working people in Australia and organisations of working people is very essential. 
um, just as it is essential for us to, to build alliances with all sectors in the community who are, who are in struggle. Um, and in a way, sort of envisaging Occupy in Australia as a movement that, that doesn't just rely on what's going on in Martin Place. You know, if we really want to build the kind of movement that's actually going to fundamentally change society in Australia, that's an anti-capitalist movement, if you like, or a movement that challenges um, challenges the global financial and economic um, and ecological system that we live under. You know, it has to be a movement that's far more of a mass uh, movement than we can even imagine today. Um, and so it's, it is about us trying to think about how we can best build it from here and establish the means, not the structures necessarily, but the space um, for people to actually get involved um, and to self-organise. Um, you know, because the GA in Martin Place can't, can't be the hub of the movement across Sydney even, um, let alone, you know, the rest of the country. Um, and I think to building um, our links with other occupiers around Australia and the world is something we need to probably put even more attention to um, uh, in the next period of, um, of the development of this movement. Well, first of all, I think it's very good um, that all the speakers were quite honest and frank, I think, uh, in, the, in the contributions they've made to the forum. So in that spirit, I'm also going to be quite honest and frank. Um, I think the, the forum that, the forum that, we, that we call this evening, you know, part of the title is, is the hope for change. And I think throughout the year we have, we have seen a new hope for change. And you know, I don't think at the beginning of the year I thought we'd see anything like Occupy Wall Street uh, in the United States. None of us expected the Egyptian Revolution or anything like that. But I also think more than just hope, there are very many challenges for those movements and there's challenges for those mov the movement here in Australia. And I think that's what, we need to, that's what we need to discuss tonight. First of all, we've seen the coordinated crackdown on you know, the occupations themselves across the US that's coordinated between the police, you know, mayors and so forth here in Australia. We were raided at, you know, at four in the morning and, and so on and so forth. And I think much to our, um, well, actually I think um, for a lot of time we ended up simply focusing on how we could maintain that occupation site and running into various kinds of ongoing battles uh, with the police as a result of that. And in my opinion, spending far too much time on that and the process of the occupation itself and the energy on that that I think could have been much better spent discussing how we're going to build you know, a political movement and so forth. And I don't actually think it's an accident that we have got 46 days into Occupy and we haven't worked out some of those things. And I think actually it's, yeah, I mean in my opinion, I, I don't think we need, to, we need to Occupy anymore. The idea of saying that, um, Look, I think an occupation itself is a tactic, you know, and it's a tactic among many, but I don't think we should raise it to the level of a principle and say that's the only thing, that's the only thing possible that this movement can do, and that's certainly not, you know, the attitude that we've seen emerging from Wall Street or, or Spain or anywhere else where this movement um, is going forward. We've seen a whole array of, of political tactics, and I think we need to consider um, some new ones here in Australia. First of all, I think we need to, we need to look at some of the, the stuff that I think Jesus was drawing out about how they're trying to mobilise larger numbers of people in Spain. First of all, is taking up taking up the racism, you know, that exists in the Spanish state against refugees. Now, here in Australia, uh, we have very, very much the same problem, and uh, that racism, I think, is essential to actually dividing the 99% in against one another and blaming each other, and I think that's something that this movement needs to take needs to take very seriously, and there's a campaign that's already, you know, that's already doing that, and I think, um, to the extent if that campaign's able to grow out of this, out of the course of this, I think that would be very important. But secondly, there's a whole range of union disputes that are going on at the moment which are very important. I think Carol and other people are going to talk about, you know, the cleaners, there was the issue with the Qantas, there's, but also the, a very, very inspiring victory that we saw recently with the beta workers uh, in Melbourne who picketed for 14 days and won all of their demands, some of the lowest paid workers in Australia who fought, you know, racism and all these sorts of things on, on the picket line um, to do that and they stood united with one another. I think there's some serious lessons uh, that we can learn from them. But I think, yeah, we need to have a discussion, you know, I think, about the things that we stand for. But also I think we need to have a discussion about creating a new organising space that's outside of the fetishisation of the occupation and the General Assemblies, which I think at the moment are only getting smaller and more laborious and, and, and more painful. So I just, yeah, I wanted to, um, to, to raise that for, for the discussion, um, you know, this evening to, to see what people think. problem when there's been a general assembly decision and some people go off and do something else. And I'm just wondering, you know, we're, if we're the occupiers conceived of as, a, as an organisation, 
or is a movement. And if it's a movement, it seems to be these multiple kind of activities don't have to be all united at all. I can't see, yes. I think that would kill it if that was expected, yeah. that everybody had to tone and read line. That's, <laughs> I, think, well, I understand all that. I haven't been actively involved in Occupy, but it's very much a separate, a, a new development and the language people are using, you know, hope and values and, and connecting with people, you know, this is the sort of other side that we have to have both the organisational skills that long-term <coughs> activists have joined with um, these interpersonal ways of being together as with, with that vision, it's that hope and vision that's, that's bringing people together. And I, I agree also with Amy that, you know, we can't fetishise the, the, the occupation um, activity, um, you know, if we can think of maybe neighbourhood-based activities that, that or, or finding a neighbourhood expression for a broader issue and, and find ways of um, bringing people together in, in a more personal way. That, that, that that's what pe that brings people together, that people being so atomised that um, this kind of way of being they do better um, than, you know, again, the, you know, the Spanish experience that people don't come to their meetings on Saturday morning because that's not what drives people. But there's some kind of connection and um, and, and to keep that hope alive and that sense of community and that there's an alternative um, is, is terrific. Uh, yeah, I'd just really like to say thanks speakers as well. Like, um, I think it's really great that both Wendy and Jesse um, kind of, yeah, were willing to uh, actually make some criticisms, um, personal criticisms of, of Occupy. So I think that's something that's been a bit missing. Um, uh, I've been to a number of GAs where any kind of criticism on the status quo within the movement itself has been met with quite a bit of hostility. And I think we are to have a very healthy um, movement and one that can you know, grow as we, I think we all want to see. Um, then there needs to be the space where there can be criticism and open criticism, and, but that uh, on a friendly level. Like we all here for, we want to see change, and obviously that's where our starting point. Um, and actually agree with Wendy in terms of the autonomous action point. It was just also just raised that I think this is a bit of a problem where. Um, um, basically group, like people can just go off and do whatever um, under the banner of Occupy City because I think if the, um, part, of, part of the thing is actually part of spreading a message and, and to do that most effectively I think there needs to be a place where there are decisions about what is the most effective action to take, how, what kind of message are we going to put out there, who are we kind of appealing to and um, I think if there's kind of anyone can go off and do whatever they like I think that's actually a bit of, it's going to be a hindrance on the movement and I think actually um, part of the, I think the where this autonomous kind of action is going out of is actually a problem with the consensus based decision making. Yeah, I kind of like disagree with Wendy in terms of consensus. Something obviously is kind of contentious issues kind of been a part of a lot of the Occupy stuff. Um, but I think, I mean, very much so, uh, because anyone can block the consensus based decision making, it means that people aren't <coughs> actually bringing stuff to GA for endorsement because they know that one person can block us, even if that means that. Even if the like, majority of, of the GA actually supports it, it, it takes only one person for that to not happen. And I think this is actually profoundly undemocratic. I mean, we, we've, we're talking about, you know, what, what's been at the heart of the Occupy movement is fighting the rule, rule of the minority. And I think re by recreating this where one person can dictate what the movement does isn't, isn't what we want to do at all. I think we actually need to look start critically very much so at the, right, and have at the majority consensus decision-making process. And so, yeah, I'd like to... Yeah, I also wanted to thank the speakers. I thought it was a fantastic um, analysis of uh, the strengths and weaknesses um, and the achievements of Occupy over the last um, 46 or 47 days. Um, I think um, one one aspect for me that stands out, and, I th and people, people allude to it um, and sometimes skirt around the issue, but I think it needs to be put out pretty clearly. I think that one, one primary challenge for us at the moment is an issue of goals and objectives. That to me is, is a sort of central issue that we need to resolve. Um, and by, by goals and objectives, I don't mean sort of what our, you know, what our demands are or something like that, or whether we have them or not. I think that that's a totally separate discussion, but what I mean is objectives that we set ourselves. So for instance, like, do we want to reoccupy Martin Place? I mean, I, I presume mo majority of people in this room would say yes, some people would say no, um, some people would say yes conditionally. 
And so then the problem when we talk about tactics is that we, we get bogged down in our consensus process around the tactics and we can't reach consensus around the tactics because we don't actually have those objectives um, figured out. So I think like objectives that we set ourselves need to be the starting point and uh, thinking about, well, we can, we, can, we can set ourselves an objective such as, for instance, by mid March next year, we want to come back with enough numbers to actually be able to hold the space and we want to set up a permanent occupation camp at Martin Place. Now, if we set ourselves that kind of objective, then what, is, what needs to go into making that happen? Well, we need to formulate a strategy around that objective. So, well, we need to go out there and talk to lots of people. We need to build alliances. We need to get enough forces together to be able to come there with 10,000 people and then reoccupy Martin Place. And then we have to think about tactics to do that. So we need to go out to Parramatta. We need to go out there. We need to do this. And I think we sort of need to maybe think in those terms, in terms of how do we, what is our primary goal that we're setting ourselves and then kind of working backwards over that. So I just wanted to put that out. That's kind of what the thoughts that have been going through my head and I think that that would be a good way to move forward. Hi, um, it's my first Occupy meeting. It's exciting to be here. I really enjoyed hearing all the speakers. It's great to see such a diverse group all together. It's a bit inspiring and I'm excited I came. Thanks. For having me. Um, and I wanted to talk to you about cleaners. Um, a few couple of people have mentioned that there's a cleaners action <coughs> happening tomorrow um, as part of a, a Clean Start campaign. Um, I don't know if many of you know lots about cleaners, but I want to talk specifically about the cleaners that clean our shopping centres and the Westfields that allow people to buy lots more things. Um, lots of the cleaners that clean the shopping centres and Westfields are migrant workers that come here. Um, they do incredibly hard physical work. They're paid minimum wage and they have a lot of insecurity around their job and lots of them, to be honest, are invisible workers. We don't notice them cleaning the food courts, changing the toilet paper and cleaning all the floors. And for about the last um, two months, they've been negotiating with Spotless, which is the largest um, cleaning contractor in the country, hugely profitable, large multinational company, um, to try to get a fair share of some of the profits that that company makes from providing cleaning to supermarkets. Um, and it's broken down. And tomorrow they're taking the first ever industrial action that cleaners in this country have ever taken. Because they, they really need your support. Um, they, need, they need people to come out with their friends, their dogs, their neighbours, and anyone that they know to show Love their charts. solidarity um, with the cleaners. Um, they're going to be doing action at the Centrepoint Tower in the city in Pitt Street tomorrow from 12 o'clock till 1 o'clock. Um, and it would be absolutely fabulous to see everyone in this room and everyone that they know, they're supporting in solidarity cleaners um, there and their struggle to get a fair share of the profits that large companies are making from their labour. Um, and I would encourage you, well, one of the actions that they're doing is they are not stocking toilet paper. So if you're not going to the toilet, I would encourage you all to bring your own toilet paper with you. Um, and they're not going to be cleaning and things. So it's going to be at the Pitt Street Mall, at the Westfields. There'll be a large contingent of cleaners and hopefully lots, lots of you guys and other community organisations in support. All day? Um, no, it's from 12 to 1. If anyone's got any questions, feel free to come and see me afterwards. Talk to one tomorrow. Tomorrow, sorry. Uh, James, no. oh. <coughs> yeah, I guess I think what Cara was saying, which extends on what Jesse was kind of pointing out, is a good enough, good place to start in terms of like what are our aims or goals. But actually, the problem goes deeper. Like, what are we actually trying to achieve with the whole Occupy Sydney thing? Uh, you know, because I, I think. I think if it, all it boils down to is that all that unites us is we want to like occupy somewhere together. Frankly, if that is it, I don't see the point in it. Like it's, that's not a political act in and of itself, simply saying that you're going to occupy somewhere. It has to actually be connected to a, an idea about we actually want to campaign around individual issues, we actually want to force <coughs> change on the government, we actually want to win things. Like it's not simply about occupying uh, for its own sake because we think that there's something virtuous about that very act. So I think that, that's, that's the real problem we have. Like, what are we actually trying to achieve? And I think Jesse pointed to is true. Like, it's more difficult for us here because the truth is uh, people can identify with us. They can identify, you know, and we have sparked a real debate about is inequality in Australia a real thing? Are all these things that are being talked about by Occupy Wall Street in any way relevant to Australia about issues about the banks, capitalism, whatever you want to call it, etc.? 
people can identify with this, but if they don't see any point in terms of what we're actually trying to achieve, then they can identify, but they're not going to get involved, they're not going to come to our events, and frankly, we're not going to go anywhere as a movement. So I think that the challenge for us actually is what, what are we trying to do and how do we link it to, like as Amy said, like building a, a political movement. Like, and I, like, to be honest, we haven't had enough of that sort of stuff. Like we haven't had enough of, well, in terms of our demonstrations, like we've done some good things. Like we tried to relate to you know, uh, the dispute at Qantas. I think you know, things like the cleaners are something we should try and relate to to you know, support groups of workers that are in struggle fighting against inequality for wage justice and these sort of things. I think we need to find like, concrete issues like that, I think, uh, that we can actually take up um, to, act, to fight for real change around, not just you know, simply saying that we're occupying, you should join us just because of who we are kind of thing. Like, we actually, actually have to be trying to achieve something. Like, in that respect, in the short term, I think, what, I think you know, the, the things that we can do are like, be part of the demonstrations on the weekend at the, the Labor conference, which are part of, act, of trying to push against the very right-wing agenda of the um, the Labor government, which generally is all about selling out to the corporations and yeah, using tools like racism to divide people and uh, you know to put up scapegoats to you know, the idea that actually should be government services. I think mean, you know, like we can look at things like the cuts that were talked about yesterday, like the, the mini budget the government handed down, which is going to you know the, the public sector union says cost three thousand jobs in the public service as a result of the um, you know whatever, euphemistically termed efficiency dividend, um, which is actually just a cut of 4% to the, the public service. Like, there's things like that we can look to take up, I think, but it's been much more difficult for us because we don't have the scale of the cuts that are happening in, in Europe or the US. But I think unless we actually have, um, you know, not just like a, a shopping list of things that we sort of stand for, um, which lots of people can agree with, unless, unless we actually have, you know, uh, you know, objectives like that are actually trying to fight and win around. Um, I think, like, we're not actually, you can't actually build a political movement unless you, you try to do that. Um, I think that, that's the real challenge for us. I think, you know, how do we actually, how do we actually take up specific issues? Like, like, the refugee issue is one that's very real that we can take up and there's already a campaign around that. But I think we have to look for, you know, in the, new year, in the new year, look for opportunities to actually relate to, you know, real struggles that are happening or try and take up um, concrete issues, you know, because it's true, like, if, 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 anything, if anything happens like what looks like it's going to happen in Europe in terms of, you know, the breakup of the euro, like the impending recession in Europe that will flow through uh, the whole rest of the world if it's serious enough, like, there will be real issues here in terms of the economic crisis that we can look to take up in the future. and I've got 16 people on the list. <laughs> Everyone's very excited, obviously. Um, so I might close it in the next bit during the next speaker, which is Arama. Um, yeah, I guess I just wanted to start as well by like reflecting on what an incredible year and unexpectedly, like I don't think this time last year any of us could have predicted the Tunisian or Egyptian revolution, like the Indignados, what's happening in Chile, Wall Street, it's incredible and it's only only going to continue into 2012, like this crisis is clearly not going anywhere, it's, it's deepening and it's going to hit Australia sooner or later. Um, but I think that we have the benefit actually of seeing some of this politics play out on a global scale before we're confronted with, with that same level of crisis and it's very you know, it's our duty, I think, to actually learn from what is happening overseas, learn from, you know, some of the lessons that this, the indignados have learned about actually, you know, making a decision that pouring their resources into maintaining an occupation at some point wasn't the best use of their resources. They made a very conscious decision to, to disband those occupations <coughs> while they were still strong, leave on a high note and go go to the suburbs, organise there, organise in the workplaces. There's been, you know, assemblies of teachers and, and doctors and, and things like that. And I think that their flexibility um, you know, and adapting to the circumstances that they actually face is a lesson that, that we need to take because we, we clearly face quite different circumstances in Australia and I think a few people have pointed out we need to work overtime to make ourselves relevant to the majority of the population and not just, you know, not just something that they can tokenistically sort of um, relate to but actually you know it, it has that much relevance that, that they want to get involved I think we have to work overtime to make that happen and I think our major task in Australia if we're going to prepare 
Australia in any way, you know, for, for a crisis that's going to hit is to start building some real social power, some, some muscle that we can actually use to take some of these actions that we're talking about. We desperately need to be, rebuild a student movement. We desperately need to rebuild the union movement. We need to rebuild a left in Australia. And I think the way to do that is to go to all, you know, all of those natural allies that Jesse was talking about all those people who are fighting the Labor government around same-sex marriage, around refugees, those unionists who, you know, at my university, they're just cutting 340 jobs. And, you know, the NTU is starting to wage a big campaign. It's probably going to go into next year. I think the spirit of Occupy can be brought to the campus, but we, we have to bring it there. And I think that requires that we are willing to step away from Martin Place. And... You know, Jesse mentioned actually there are issues that can bring down social movements. I think what we're seeing happen at, at Martin Place is, is a symbol actually of this movement starting to wane. It's not something healthy. I think it's, it's actually starting to turn in on itself. I think the consensus has become a major, major block to building. I think, you know, someone, Ben mentioned absolutely right that actually the reason that people are doing autonomous actions is because it doesn't feel like a democratic movement when one person can block your decision. That doesn't feel democratic and you don't feel any accountability to a movement, movement like that. And I don't think it's healthy for actually building, you know, big participatory <coughs> meetings where people, sometimes they lose, sometimes they win, but, you know, we, all, we know that we all stick together and can, can go forward. So I think, you know, some issues like that actually could kill this movement. And I think unless we can change those, we do, we are going to have to set up, you know, some sort of, find some other way of organising this stuff if it's going to continue into 2012. Because I think, you know, there's going to be big things coming to Australia and, I, you know, I don't want to miss that, that opportunity. So I think we need to, you know, confront these, these questions we face head on. Like, what, the things that propelled us into action in the first place have not gone away. In fact, they're being exacerbated every day. Um, and we've talked a lot about, you know, Spain and Chile today, but we know that this week alone, in the UK, well, today, it's very early morning in the UK right now, but in, by, by early this, tomorrow morning, our time, it will be the largest public sector strike in the UK that's happened in decades. Um, even, even the school principals who are in a separate union and notoriously conservative are joining this public sector strike against the Cameron government in the UK. And Occupy London are going to be there in droves to support them. And I think that's a fantastic thing. Likewise, there's going to be a mass rally um, in Washington, D.C. I think it's, I don't, can't remember exactly what day. I think it um, may have already happened or it's tomorrow. But that's also happening. And, the, and a lot of the Occupy movements in the U.S. are relating to those things that are happening outside. And I think, you know, to take um, Jesse's analogy about cleaning our house because we want to invite people to our house, I think that's incredibly true. And we can't ignore some of the problems, some of the tensions, some of the disagreements that have happened. And we need to try and put those out there and try and resolve them. But we can't expect, no matter how beautiful we make our house, that people are necessarily going to come to our party. We ourselves have to go out. We have to go out and rage. We have to go out and organise. We have to go out whether it's, you know, I don't know, the markets, the dance parties, the festivals, whatever. You know, home, home bakes on this Saturday, for example. Everyone How many kids Sunday. could potentially come to us? You know, um, the Occupy Suburbs was just a tiny bit of what we could do. A tiny bit of what we could do. That thing we had two weeks leading up to the 5th of November. We need an action where we've got two months to build it. And we go sick. And we go out. And we don't expect people to come to our little house. That we go out there and we try and relate to everything that's happening in society that's and try and draw people in. I apologise to everyone in this part of the list that we are going to be going like this, but it would be great so everyone gets to go if people could try and keep the time a little bit in mind. Um, just two minutes. Is, is um, yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I don't see the contradiction between having occupiers in Martin Place and with what everybody else has been saying. So I don't see it as a do or... You know, I, I think if particularly if we're talking about openness and trust and trying to work with more people, why are we going to kind of 
try to shut down courageous people in my mind yeah. um, that want to mm. be at Martin Place. So, so I personally don't see a problem with that. Um, the other thing was that, um, that, that yes, what Shelley said, and I think also what Tim was saying, that it's very hard, you know, like being open, being listening, and we also have to recognise that we make mistakes. And that's the crux. The crux is when we make the mistakes, how to acknowledge that and to see how we can actually work together, okay? And so that, that I think, is the real <laughs> nitty-gritty in terms of when we... When there are all those tensions or all those disagreements, there's those power plays, and there are. There are power plays within Occupy. We have to be frank about that. And we have to try to, you know, acknowledge that and say, well, you know, how can we do this better? I actually felt, I'm being hypothetical, I felt dismissed at this particular meeting or this GA. How can we make it better? So, so that is really hard. Um, and, sorry, there was just something else. Oh, the spontaneous action. I personally don't see a problem with spontaneous action. I think, it, I think it's really optimistic to think that we are going to all work as a movement, as a conglomerate in one direction. I mean, that's madness. We are all diverse people. We all have different passions. I'm not particularly passionate about going to the ALP conference, and I'm not going to do that. I'm going to put my time into something else. If I, were, if I had the time, I would go to, the, to support the cleaners strike tomorrow, but I work, so I can't do that. Right. So we also have to recognise that, you know, that there is kind of a, a duality here. I'm hearing that people are, are anti-bureaucratic, yet I'm hearing all this long-term planning, all these goals, all this that, that is bureaucratic, yeah. that is <laughs> So there's a bit of a con contradiction there. Um, and also with the wider society, I, I think there's some apathy, I think there's also people who don't know what to do, and I think there are people who just want more money in their, in their wage packet. They don't want to change their lifestyle. Right? Or there are people who are, are horrified that seven million children die every year, but they don't, know, they don't want it to really do impact somehow on their lives, right? It's a bit like, the, I'm gonna do an analogy between paying rent and a cooperative, okay? Some people just wanna pay the rent. They just wanna pay the rent. They want to just be able to tell the landlord, fix it. They don't wanna be in a cooperative. A cooperative is a hard yakka. And so that is hard to attract people that are willing to be in a cooperative. Alan. Oh. Okay, hi, I'm Alan. Good uh, one of the Howdy boys. Uh, one, one of the things that attracted me to Occupy was the fact that uh, there was a notion in it that a new thing was going to happen. And to me, the notion of a new thing is that it doesn't have to do with old things. And so through being involved with Occupy, I've noticed that uh, the first three things that Occupy actually did was to set up three working groups. They set up a media group, they set up a facilitation group, and they set up uh, an outreach group. And when I stand back from that, I say to myself, what does that represent? Maybe that's Occupy trying to tell me that they're interested in education and facilitation. And so for myself, I see that one of the core values, so to speak, of, of Occupy, or one of its core functions, it's the thing that we've done from the very first day, is to educate and facilitate. And I think that that's a very powerful basis to start from compared with doing a lot of the things that we seem to get ourselves involved in in ways that have been done before and I would put fairly strongly have proved to be ineffectual because if they were effectual we wouldn't be in the situation that we're in now yeah. and so that's why new methods have to be devised. And I think it's only through participating in Occupy, in Occupy 
and participating in the discussion that's occupied and the conversation that's occupied will we realise how it is that we have to actually learn to live occupy as individuals. And once we start doing that, then we'll be able to get some better idea of what these new ways actually are, and then we'll be in a position to learn about them, and then we'll be in a position to occupy about them, and then we'll be in a position of interacting about them, then we'll be in a position to discuss them, and then we will be in a position to make proposals and bring those proposals to action through collaboration. And I think by looking at what Occupy actually is and what we are doing, we will get a far better idea of what it is we should be aiming towards doing. First thing I'd like to say is like I'd go to your party mark even if your house was dirty. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think for me like the the, the two key pillars of Occupy uh, has one been our, our message that we are the 99% that our world is ruled by a 1% that don't do so in our interests and that we, we we've had enough of it and we want to see a change. And the second thing that's been an integral of part of Occupy is that the people who have been around, the people who have gone out and done the hard work and have made it happen. If you take either of those two pillars out of it, then not one of the flash mobs, not one of the working groups, not one of the rallies, not any of the, speed, the working sh workshops we've had, not the occupation. Without those two pillars, none of those things was possible. So I think um, going forward that we need to be focusing on, on ba making both those things stronger. So I think we need, like I sort of Jesse talked about, like taking our message and making it stronger, refining it, defining it better, like figuring out exactly how it is that Australia is run, run by the one percent, what exactly we're doing, and, and tying it into the real life things like Qantas and stuff that we, we see today. Like that's the, the first thing, and then the second thing, bringing the people and the social mass that is occupied together as much as possible, building the strength of our working groups, building our you know, organisation is a word that some people might not be comfortable with, but whatever you want to say, but building the networks and the people that make up Occupy. And I think those are the two things that we need to be focused on going forward. Um, and if we do that, then Occupy will continue to, uh, to, to grow and to, to be a movement that we, has already made change in, in just 46 days. Like 46 days on one hand is a hell of a long time considering where we started from, um, but it's also an incredibly short time considering the, 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 what we're aiming to do, the, the sheer scale of, of the project that we've set ourselves. Um, so if we continue to do that, it's going to be hard work and it's going to be stuff that is going to mean a lot of, you know, probably more painful GAs and, and uh, hard work and a lot of like, long discussion that will sometimes feel like it's going around in circles. But there's no alternative to getting around those things. I think for a lot of people, and I think just about everyone in Occupy, looks for sort of like uh, silver bullets that if we just got rid of, um, you know, this thing or that, or if we just refined this, then we could would, would make this qualitative leap and then all of a sudden capitalism would be destroyed in Australia. <laughs> Are you saying that's not that. true? <laughs> <laughs> but I think, like, for, for me, like, I, I, I think that we need to refine our consensus stuff, but we can't do that without without coming to a consensus on what we're doing. I think, like, you know, with, with the occupation side, you know, I'm not necessarily convinced it's as efficient at the moment, but I think scrapping it completely without having a plan of what we're doing, you know, that doesn't yeah. achieve anything either. I think we need to have a strategic plan and, and figure out where we're going and then we can do it. Fine. Sorry for going over time. Winnie is on the list now to sort of respond to a couple of the questions that we yeah. asked of her. Sorry, I'm, I, I won't I'm try to be brief. I just wanted to clarify um, what I, and my remarks about autonomous actions um, because I believe really strongly in autonomy and my and consensus and my remarks were that um, my my understanding of autonomy is the spirit of 100% freedom 100% responsibility and so you know I think that people know best what's what's best for them how best to struggle and organize and the GA as being about facilitating accountability um, about that not as autonomous actions, as a way of avoiding accountability. And also, the consensus, what I see is, I guess, people coming to the GAs to try and control Occupy, and I, I just, um, and and not trying to build unity through our diversity, through the self-organising of autonomy. So, I guess that was, that was where my remarks were aimed at. Um, I certainly think that <coughs> what makes Occupy different at the moment is, is the base of, of occupation, um, because as, as people have talked about, 
there is a lot of learning and dialogue and transformation that is already happening and I think um, already extremely powerful in the ways that we are even relating to each other and, and these issues and the kind of ideological shifts in, in discourses around some of these issues that we've already achieved through occupying. So, um, yeah, I just really wanted to, I guess, just clarify some of that and, and I, I didn't spend that much time, but it, um, I just emphasising the, the, the learning that is happening um, and how exciting I think that is and, and the real plea to, to keep listening and not, you know, run before we walk um, at this stage as well because social movements are obviously, as we know, extremely hard to build and to figure out, but I see a real spirit of wanting to do that. So, anyway, just want to, that to continue. Thank you. Not exactly sure what your name is, but your name. Peter, thank you. Um, I might, might look like uh, oldie and mainstream. Um, well, not really, although in a way that's good because you want to pull the lights and sort of links with as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, uh, I was an activist way back in the 70s, and I still am an activist in public housing areas in Western Sydney. Um, and I'm also a researcher and writer. And from my perspective, um, Occupy is the most exciting thing I've seen um, since those days. And, uh, you know, I have a lot of hope uh, about what Occupy can achieve. But I just want to spell out a couple of things. So I really believe passionately that um, Occupy is the beginning of, of something that we need but we need to figure out how to make it sustainable. Now, I take the point that it's not like, you know, the agenda is going to fall out of the sky. In a sense, it's something that evolves as you go through. Uh, but there's a couple of things I want to say about that. One is um, about the risks. There's a, a decision-making process that you look at a matrix, um, and part of the matrix is risk. Now, the risks, there are risks. Um, for example, uh, we heard about the recent election in Spain where they ended up with a more conservative government. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've got to get the act together so that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And also um, in Egypt where the, a whole, you know, in a way that sort of set off a whole ripple, global ripple effect, which was really exciting. But now, you know, because they ended up with a military government and that's not really what they wanted so they have to figure out I've only just started <laughs> no I'm not going to go long I promise I'm nearly finished actually um, so you know they ended up with a military government so they, now they've got to figure out how to get rid of that and even in within your own group here there's this dilemma you know about consensus and um, and diversity and all that so you're going to have to figure out you know, how to get through those things. And at the same time, you know, hold the whole thing together. And the last thing I want to say, though, is about hope, because I do believe, you know, that the world needs this, um, our society needs this, we as individuals need this, um, the future generations need this, so we've got to make it work. So what I'm hopeful about is, with all those, that passion and commitment and, you know, um, ideas and, and so forth that we will make it work and I just want to finish with a little reference to something that is in the latest Green Left Weekly there's an article there <coughs> by Peter Trainer, uh, who lives out of Liverpool I know him personally he actually is an academic but he lives what he believes in read the, the article in Green Left Weekly and one of the things he is saying is it's not about, you know, simply pulling down capitalism, um, which in a sense is the enemy, but you've got to have something to replace it with. And he actually lives out what, what he believes it should be replaced with. And, and the thing to do that you want to replace it with, you know, is um, uh, a social movement that is inclusive for everybody. 
So uh, a totally different kind of system. So it's beginning to live a life that embodies, you know, the kind of future that you want to see. And that's up to each one of us in our personal lives, in our relationships, in our political action. How to live um, things like ethics and, and passion and justice and compassion and stuff. So live out those things. It's not just about the political dimension, and it's about including as many people as possible, you know, within uh, those alliances. Very true. Um, just really before the next speaker, like, um, in the interest of time, these two people didn't put themselves on the speaking list. We've got two interstate occupied visitors, um, Gemma from Adelaide and Zeb from Perth. Um, who are here and they've been to and, um, Gemma gave me a copy of Occupy Adelaide's vision statement, but um, I, which I assume is also online. So maybe yeah, yeah. Adelaide. So I've got a copy here, but I'll look it up online. And it is very exciting to have people here. Um, the next person is yeah. Thank you. Well, yeah, it's, it's, that's a bit of a segue. My name is Nikki. Um, and yeah, it's that's a nice kind of segue to what I was going to say because, like. What I really believe and what I've been like saying for a while now is that I think we really need a, a a statement that's basically like a value and vision statement, you know, something that like really binds us all together and on from what this gentleman said too, it's not like so much political as it is from heart, you know, like it is from consciousness, it's from like an evolution of looking at a world that like is very void of of, of a conscience and moving into a world where the, that is in abundance, you know, because that's, I mean, for me anyway, that, that's why we're here. And I think that if we had that, you know, and we had that document that we kept coming back to, it would really facilitate, um, you know, like the consensus, <coughs> for instance, you know, like I think if there was something that we could always align ourselves with, like, you know, thinking about your block too and going like, is that does that correlate with what the group in, in a broad sense of the of you know what the values that we really stand for all together are you know that could be something that we can always come back to as well and like if we all agree to a foundation which is you know we're building a house like we're talking about we're not just cleaning it either you know what i mean like we haven't properly even built a foundation yet and that's that is very much the first step, you know? So if we can keep coming back to the foundation going, well, you know, is, is this proposal that we're putting forward, does it really correlate with what we feel is really important um, as a group? I think that would help, you know, even with the autonomous stuff. If this could be something that we could make very public, very out there, you know, and if people do things that are autonomous, that's fine, you know, because this is a very free movement. We can't tell people that they can't do things. But for instance, if something's like violent, or if it if it doesn't really work in line with the thank you, with the um, with the values of the group, then we can make that very public to the media and to all these kind of things. You know, I'm in the media group and one of the media coordinators, and they want us to 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 break and they want to be able to really like shove in happiness because you know the media are just another arm of the um, of, of the one percent. So yeah, I, I think it, that would be really powerful. I hear you, I'll be one more second. Um, so I think that would be really powerful because then we can say, look, it's a free movement. People are obviously going to do things on their own accord, but our values are this and just keep driving that home and even use those situations to drive that home further, you know? So, I mean, obviously we're not making proposals, but if we were, I would like to say we should actually start a group talking about this. And just, and it would be amazing then to be, like, to kind of uh, push it out, like, to Australia, get everyone to, like, you know, talk about, like, the things that they want to add or things they should bring out. And then even, I'm a bit of a dreamer, but, like, even the world, you know, make this a full-on, like, world movement where everyone stands together and says, you know, is this is what we believe in. If you believe in this too, if you want to see this in the world, come join us. Right. Um, firstly, I'm impressed with a lot of things coming out of this movement. For example, the fact that in, your, in 
America are taking up occupations as a tactic, I think is really good. But the issue I'm going to raise is one of disagreement. I do not like this idea of 99%. I think that there are a hell of a lot of other people who are our enemies and we must state them as such and we must recognise them as such. Other business people, not in the 1%, for starters. Judges, bureaucrats, cops and all of them. Now, okay, many people, many people sort of think of 1% as the bush, but see 99% as working people. I find that a bit sloppy, but I think it goes a bit deeper than that in terms of organising our movement. For example, I was in Melbourne last week and uh, it was suggested that we name people who are our, clearly our friends, like uh, housewives, unemployed, workers, etc. It was objected to because apparently it would suggest that other people are not welcome. I actually do not welcome uh, cops, bureaucrats, judges, etc. And I think they're organising problems, you know. Can black f people feel comfortable about a movement if, if it is suggested that cops might be welcome? Could queer people be, feel welcome if it's suggested that the Hillsong Church is wel welcome, etc., etc., etc.? Could unemployed people feel welcome in an organisation which welcomes uh, so workers. Yeah, social security <laughs> workers and, and, and people who oppress them, etc., etc., etc.? That's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> I'm in charge, right? Yeah. It has 30 seconds to go. Uh, next, we're in the second last row, just there. <coughs> and guys, first of all, thanks for you guys for throwing the uh, meeting today. It's been really good. Thank you. Getting text messages on my phone, I was really impressed uh, that I had the ability to come across. I really haven't had much to do with the movement, uh, but one thing that I've learned pretty much uh, across looking over the internet over the last eight weeks to six months is that we've all got the same mentality. We've all got the same, like, I suppose, agenda that we're all going with. We're trying to identify, we've identified what the problem is. And now we're coming up with all of these little things that are bumping and having problems amongst the group, like religion, like sexuality and all these kind of things. Now, if you can, if, you, if we can focus on getting those things out of the agenda and out of the movements and all that kind of thing, I think that we'll have a lot more power in numbers because people will want to come along more. Like you were saying before, if you're gay and there's people that are going to be singing Hillsong songs at the movements, they're not going to feel comfortable because they know that Hillsong don't accept gay people kind of thing. But I, th I, I like to think of a metaphor when it comes to dealing with things like that and that's you can go into the darkest room, so this room could have absolutely no lights, and you could walk in with a little candle and the whole room will light up with light, but you can't take any amount of darkness and walk into a room full of people that have all got the same idea, which is what we've got. We've got the idea about raising awareness that we are getting screwed on an international level, and it will hit Australia eventually. And we're the lucky few people that will all be aware of what's happened before it happened kind of thing. Not that we want to turn around and say, ha ha, we knew, <laughs> you know, sucked in, because we're all going to be in the same boat when it does happen. But as I was saying, you can't take any amount of lightness into that dark room, and every single bit of evil will be gone. All of the, all of the, all of, all of the questions will be answered. All of the things that won't get answered, they will be hidden in a corner or underneath a book or underneath the shelf or underneath a rug. So I think focus on focusing on the numbers um, and not focusing on these little problems that we're having amongst the group will make people like myself want to have a lot more to do with the with the movements actively. One is. Every time I go to the general assemblies, I don't ever stay. I go and get drunk, and that's actually not like every single time. And it's a bit telling. Um, I think that no, no, no. <laughs> I think that they kind of uh, they oscillate between being boring and sort of things that we don't necessarily like. We shouldn't have to make decisions about, and also luxury. And that's not like a criticism of any one in particular, I, I want to say that many people, we've been doing the best we can, so it's not saying that we're hopeless or anything like that, it's just saying that um, we need to change it up. <laughs> um, one thing that I walk away, I was like, I, I didn't, I haven't learned anything, like, I've, I, yeah, but banks are bad, this is bad, this is, you know, the vibe, I think, was the word that was used, but um, it would be really exciting if we could turn that space that we were trying to create into something that we can... Um, be doing something that's more purposeful, something that we can learn, and, and I, I guess those little moments of things that have occurred like that with um, free school and things like that, I think that we need to, um, we could work on that a bit more so that there's like more spaces of learning, more spaces of providing the things that we say that the system doesn't provide, and um, those kinds of ways where we could come together and actually um, challenge ourselves, challenge, like learn something, 
and then maybe I won't have to go to the pub. Um, I mean, obviously the decisions have to be made, and I think that the one other really quick point I want to say is that we really need to think about self-facilitation as well. Um, I, I can name like two people that kept this time tonight. Like, it's already, a, you know, I mean, that's just one indication of saying, <laughs> okay, yeah, we just need to think about that and take it off responsibility for it. The two things that really struck out for me was that people weren't there just because they opposed the refugee rights policy of the government or one particular issue, but they were angry about a lot of different things. I think the second thing that really attracted the people there and made the spirit of the day, which is quite different from most of the normal rallies we have here in Sydney, was that people felt excited by this idea of the Occupy, even if they didn't want to stay there the night themselves, and in fact the majority didn't, but they were quite inspired by it. I think if you could sum it up, it was... People said, look, I'm just fed up with a lot of things, and this time I'm not going home. You know, I'm just going to stay here. So I think that's, that's what it started with. Then where are we today? Well, I think it's clear that while the occupation for the first week, and I agree with the speaker that, that said, mentioned it before, I think it's probably getting a bit of a harsh rap now. Um, I also don't think that we can just focus on the occupation that we have to that Mark Place. That does not mean that we should get rid of it. I think it's great that people are there, and I think we, we, we should encourage that. I think it becomes a problem, though, when it restricts us from being able to do other things. And I think sometimes that the, the focus on the occupation has stopped us. Like even, for instance, debating whether we could have this meeting here or not, or whether we can have a march or not, because it might start somewhere else. I think that's where the problem is, not with the occupation. I also agree that what other people have said about we should go to other rallies, but I mean, I mean, there's already groups doing those other things as well. So I don't really see that as the future for Occupy. Um, we should do that 100%, but if that's all we do, well, I just see that also as not really, not recapturing that initial spirit. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't have the answer of how to recapture that, but I think if we can focus on that is where we're actually going to go forward. And I think it means not focusing just on the on the occupation, although, you know, as, as useful as that is, and not just being one more group that goes to a lot of rallies. My last point, on the consensus point, and I, I need to say this because I, I think it, it is important to have a frank debate. I, I think too many times it's just been said that, um, that consensus is the, is, the, is the going model. Actually, in Spain, they do not use consensus anymore. They've gone against that. In my time in Latin America, most, if not all, the social movements do not use consensus as their decision-making process. So I think it is a bit of a furphy to sort of say this is, this is the starting point of where we should be, and actually most movements don't apply that at the moment, even if they don't apply majority vote either. <laughs> we should add that. Good. Four more. So I think one of the really important things about the Occupy movement, starting with Wall Street in America, is its recognition and its challenge to the existing political system, its recognition that the existing political system there is corrupt, totally corrupt. The two parties basically do the bidding of what we call, for better or worse, the 1%. So, um, the movement there has challenged the existing political system um, in that it has really denied its legitimacy. And so I think it would not be um, going forwards, it might be going backwards, if we changed Occupy here into a political movement within the existing political system, which just tries to use <laughs> political means as they have been known. And so um, I made, made that main point, but I'll just say that it is for those reasons that I actually am attached, A, to the occupation in Martin Place as a statement that we do not accept even petty rules about no camping. And I am also attached to the consensus system, although it has its problems, but I would like us to try to work to learn it better and to use it because it is a rejection of the so-called democratic principle in existing politics of majority rule, which means that 51% overrides and totally ignores and does not listen to the 49%. Mm. Yeah. 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 
saw some Jim just covered some of the stuff I wanted to say. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it again. I really think it's I think for Why myself and I, and I think obviously for Jim and others, yeah, the, uh, the Occupy movement stands outside the status quo. It stands outside the current political system. And the, the very occupation, although I agree, it can't be the centre of Occupy forever. But, but um, it, it is a demonstration of exactly that, that we don't accept the way things are. We're going we're gonna to be here, we're going to occupy this space, even if it's only two of us. We're going to have our meetings here, or whatever. Mm. And, um, and like I didn't say, you know, that, that when we say Occupy stands outside the system, I say it actually stands outside the left. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I really want to rebuild the left, the left of Australia, or the left of, uh, of the world. Let the left rebuild itself. Like, um, let, let's, let's, move, let's, let's show another way, and yeah. have the left come to us. And um, not that I don't love all you guys on the left. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and I wanted to say to, to, to the people, like, I think it's Amy, right? You, you were speaking when I arrived on October 15th, and I, died, I planned to come at 12, but it was a bit late because I was setting up a Twitter account. And I sat down, and we're in the middle of some, we're in the middle of some I think, open mic, and we're doing some jazz hand stuff. And, um, and, and this is what I want to say to the, to the, to the experienced activists that are getting impatient, getting frustrated, that we're not, we're not doing enough, that we're not, we're, not, we're, not, we're not growing. Is it like we are the recruits? You know, we've been awakened. Um, we've been empowered through engagement, and dare I say the engagement's been through consensus. Um, we've learnt that we can change society by doing it ourselves. Maybe this is what a grassroots social movement looks like. has been the license it's given to everyone, regardless of how they've been involved in Occupy, to talk about politics and to talk about what's wrong with the system, what they think should be done about it. And I, I, the experience I've had um, is just anywhere I go, people just start talking about, yeah, I, and I really think X, Y and Z should be done about this and that, and this is the way we could do it. And So it, in, in many ways it's lifted the lid on political discussions. And so I just I, I start with that because I think Occupy Sydney, just like Occupy Adelaide or anywhere else, is sort of like done a phenomenal thing for us, you know, as part of the 99%. Yes, in, in all its different ways, all its mixed mixed ways, all its ups and downs, ins and outs, but it's it's un it's, it's lifted a lid, I suppose. And so because there's not much time, I thought maybe I'd just throw into the mix an idea I've been thinking about, because I agree with the comments about we need to we need to do some planning. I mean, we can't plan for everything, and I do agree with the, the, the sentiment that there's some unplanned things that are very, very good and useful and important. But let's plan for something big. I just want to chuck into the mix something around Survival Day. Now, of course, we'd have to be talking entirely with the Indigenous people that are organising what's become mainly a concert now, but if people can remember back to, when was it, the bicentenary protests, that were, they were massive against the bicentenary <coughs> celebrations and all that went with it, but they were massive. What about, if people think it's a good idea, we start thinking about what would be the possibilities for Occupy Sydney to demonstrate its support for the Indigenous people of this land, and for all the oppression that's been meted out, that continues, the, you know, the racism and all the rest of it. I mean, it is a uniting theme among the 99%. Now, look, it could be very complicated and all the rest of it, but something to think about. What was that? Occupy opposes the occupation. Yeah, my name is Viv. I, I just wanted to start out by thanking everyone for coming along tonight, not just the speakers up the front. I think they did a great job, but I think this, this meeting is really important and it has been a really important starting point to kind of have some of these discussions that haven't been able to come out in other ways and that sort of thing. I mean, I, yeah, I've, I've been hugely inspired and, uh, by, by the whole Occupy movement and the, the first week. Um, you know, it was just a really beautiful, um, amazing thing, and other people have said it that it was really about, uh, you know, reaching out to people with hope and that sort of thing. And um, I mean, I think that is one of the big strengths of the movement that it is it is inclusive and, and democratic and that sort of thing. Um, I just wanted to touch on a couple of things. I mean, I think the the idea of the occupation as a tactic. I mean, I, I think that is correct, and we we should 
um, be thinking about that, not to fetishize certain tactics too much or, or that sort of thing. Certainly, I think we should should be looking to do something longer term to, to reoccupy somewhere, whether it be Martin Place or somewhere else, somewhere in the new year. And I agree with Carol that we, we should be looking at, at that way to have a longer term perspective and a bit of a strategic plan. Because, I mean, I think um, organisation doesn't necessarily, it doesn't have to equal bureaucracy and that sort of thing. And we, we do need to, to organise some things. Um, I also just wanted to say a couple of things about consensus because it has been mentioned by a few of the speakers here tonight and um, I mean I, I, yeah I have certain problems with the consensus project but I mean if you look at it, the decisions that we have made you know over the past 40 days or so there has been a lot of decisions and there has been a lot of consensus reached um, and I think one of the strengths of the consensus model is that it is really about taking people through the process of democracy and, and convincing people of the arguments and that sort of things it's really about um, it, being inclusive and taking people along with you rather than just having a quick vote and um, yeah, ignoring people in the minority. Um, I mean, one thing I wanted to just to throw up about that and maybe start a bit of a discussion about how we can modify the consensus process and that sort of thing. I mean, one of the things I was thinking is that one of the things I find most frustrating about the GAs and about the consensus process, like you have a really long discussion about uh, decisions about what we're going to do and that sort of thing, and we go through right to the end where we actually look to get consensus from the group um, and it gets right to the end where someone could, could block the, the motion and that sort of thing. Um, and I, Yeah, I mean, I think part of, part of that I find really frustrating because, it, yeah, it does take the wind out of your sails. Like, you've, everyone's you know, been doing the jazz hands and it looks like, oh, everyone's in agreement here and then comes the block. And it, it, it can be really frustrating. <laughs> but one of the things I was thinking that we could try and change that and maybe when we go move to a call for consensus at the end, the first thing we do is not ask for consensus, but ask for any blocks. And then that way it gives people who do have a strong objection to, to, to the motion uh, to get up and speak why, why they're against that motion. And then that could kick open the discussion further. I think that way it could actually be a bit more constructive and actually, take pe as I say, take people through the process and the people who are time, blocking, um, you, you know, that gives them a chance to, to say why and try and convince people why it should be blocked totally or why we should move on. Thank you.